So it's a pleasure to introduce Jinren Zhu. Um, so Jinren uh, got his PhD from Berkeley. He was a BP here, and he's now at Caltech. He will speak on piatic sataki and the arithmetic of Shimura varieties. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot for uh, introduction, and thanks org organizer for invitation. It's a great honor to speak. Here, so uh, so I guess the f I guess the title of my talk is like geometric sataki for piatic groups and uh, arithmetic of Shimura varieties. So I think the basically divided in two parts. The first part is uh, uh, geometric sataki for piatic group. That's going to be the first lecture, and the second lecture is going to be some kind of applications of this uh, result to some arithmetic problems. So uh, let's start with uh, uh, we all know this. Uh, uh, an analogy between uh, uh, the f if we in, the, in our first uh, uh, course in number theory, gradual course in number theory, when oh no, there's a uh, an analogy between uh, rest field of rational numbers and uh, uh, function fields of one variable over finite field. For example, um, we have a uh, ring of integers. This is just a ring. Z, is, you can think this is a, a polynomial ring of one variable coefficient of p. So on the data domain, but in this case, there are unique factorization uh, UFD, in fact, right? Uh, and the, we have primes, two, three, five. But, uh, the, here I have irreducible polynomials. So, you know, x, x plus one, x minus one, x plus two. Or generally, you have prime p. Here is any irreducible uh, polynomial p of x, right? So, uh, and uh, in this, we have residue field O f mod p. So we have some finite field two, three, and here it's always uh, f p to the r, some like field of characteristic p. So r is basically the degree, I guess, of the polynomial. Uh, and uh, for every prime, you get associated to uh, absolute value. And uh, uh, so, in fact, V is uh, all these primes. And there's an additional one called infinity. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, those valuation, uh, absolute value associated to prime is usually given by as follows. For example, if you have some A in O of F, its uh, absolute value is, uh, for example, uh, uh, norm of p minus n. And let's see, p to the n divides a. So uh, n, so here, no, and for example, this is a cardinality of, uh, this is just the cardinality, the residue field. OK. Uh, so there are certain analogies, but uh, of course there's a great difference uh, between number field and uh, function field variable. One part is uh, in particular for this uh, absolute value infinity. Here is uh, our usual value, uh, absolute value on rational numbers, so it's Archimedean valuation. But uh, uh, for the function field, this valuation, uh, absolute value of infinity is non Archimedean, basically pick up the degree of this polynomial. So it's the Quite different, but the, mm, okay. But the the analogy goes further. If we just pass to the local field, if we just consider the completion of the uh, uh, of our fields f with respect to this uh, non non Archimedean valuation, then here we just get basically get Q, Q P, which contains a ring of integer z, p. If you, you can even write it as sum of a, i, p to the i. Yeah. It's from 1 to p minus 1. And uh, in this case, you get uh, always get a uh, Laurent series field with one variable. So it con contains a ring of integer f, p to the r, dot bracket t. You can write it as. Uh, a i t to the i, 
Now a i is uh, in the recipe. Okay, so here you usually think t is uh, just the polynomial x. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, let me write this instead. Okay, so uh, of course there's a you know there's a lot of questions you can because of this analogy there are a lot of questions you can formulate both for for both these two kinds of fields. Uh, but the, uh, but of course this is this guy is is really related to number fields, num number theory. But the uh, function field of one variable in fact uh, related to uh, geometry of algebraic curves. So there are a lot of questions you can formulate for both of them. There are two situations. Either the solution of the questions are, if you formulate the same, maybe the, you have a, the, the way to prove it is also the same. But, uh, there are in, but in many other cases, uh, even you can formulate the questions exactly the same, but uh, maybe ex not exactly, but more or less the same, but the proof will be dramatically different. And the, in most cases, the, uh, in this situation, the situation would be simpler, basically because uh, it's really related to geometry of algebraic curve, or when you pass to C, there's something, has some, you have, at least you get some intuition from the Riemann surface. So, so uh, therefore, uh, nowadays I think there's a kind of, a, so I think traditionally, although there, there are questions for both of them, but uh, traditionally, it's just some formal analogy. But nowadays, there's some, some certain, certain way to take some questions for related to number field, like some, can be, you can first uh, understand it through the questions for local fields like QP, okay? But now if you pass to the local field, the analogy is uh, much closer than the, the original analogy here. And uh, there's some, usually not always, but uh, in many good cases, there's some, uh, one can use results or one can first understand questions for eco-characteristic local fields. And in fact, some results here could be used to attack questions here. But uh, when you pass to the equal characteristic, then there's a nice thing because now you move to the world of algebraic geometry. You have the global curve, so you have some geometry of x. Could sometimes help to solve uh, questions of uh, uh, related to equal characteristic local field. So there are some, a few examples one can use, eventually using the geometry related to, maybe not related to x, finally give, find some deeper applications in the question for uh, number field. I think the, at least one of the most su successful examples is uh, this uh, proof of fundamental lemma. So I'll go just pass to this line. Uh, so I guess today's lecture, I would uh, somehow give some other example where the really the original the theory start here, but at the end the, you find uh, some kind of uh, applications to questions related to Q. So uh, all right. So but the basically, what's going to be the question we are uh, going to ask? Of course, one one of the most important questions for both is to for to understand the field is to understand the, its Galois group, uh, which is uh, roughly speaking the some automorphism of the algebraic closure of F or separable closure of F as a group. It's in fact a perfinite group, namely it's a inverse limit of finite groups automorphism of uh, E over F, where E over F is, uh, let's see, 
finite, separable tension. Uh, so as a perfinite group, the Gaua group of uh, either Q and uh, uh, FPX, it's very hard to understand in general. For example, it's really hard to write on a single element. I think, I don't know, I can't write on a single element in, the, uh, in this group in general. But if you are just doing at the finite level, for example, uh, if you just consider uh, the simplest case, like E is the Q adjoint I over Q, then you can easily find out, write on a uh, automorphism, send the I to minus I. But when you pass to inverse limit, uh, I don't know how to write on a single element. So in general, this is a, uh, something really hard to understand, but um, uh, the only thing, I guess, we know the structure abstract of this Galois group is if I choose the embedding of uh, F bar into the um, algebraic closure of the corresponding local field, then the local Galois group would uh, map into the global Galois group. And uh, in this case, the, the group, the Gaua group for the local field is, uh, is easier to understand. It's slightly easier, I mean, much easier, I should say, but it's still, still it's uh, something difficult. Namely, uh, we know it has uh, some ramification, uh, inertia subgroup and the quotient is uh, just a topological cyclic group generated by the Frobenius element. Okay, so what we know is just this uh, conjugate for every every prime num prime uh, conjugate class of such uh, uh, subgroups with uh, some structure like that, but the, the group of this, um, for example, inertia is still complicated. Okay, so uh, of course, then one way to study those topological groups, we just need to understand the I mean, general, we wanna understand the uh, the topological groups by representations. I'm gonna study the representations of a Galois group. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so for so for one dimensional representation we basically understand uh, pretty well it's a, it's a classic story it's a cl it's a class field theory this is more or less the same as uh, uh, characters some abelian group, A cross ma F cross, where A, F is just a ring of adels, restrict product of all F, V contains the ring of integ integral adels, it's just a product of a uh, uh, ring of uh, local integer. So this is basically class field theory. We understand uh, I think it starts from end of 19th century and uh, more or less complete uh, middle of 20th century. So. And uh, to understand uh, higher dimensional non abelian represent, uh, representation of Galois group, this is uh, now this is uh, the big program of Langland's program. So basically, we want to under study the representation of a Galois group uh, to higher dimensional representation of a Galois group. So let me, I think, to, to avoid many uh, compli uh, complicity from the group theory or combinatorics or so ever, I would just, uh, in, uh, maybe in the whole lecture, maybe except, to, except at the end, the, I would just consider two dimensional thing. Uh, I mean, the, this will be my group G later on. 
I just consider some group G, G02. So, uh, so, but the, plus some technical condition. For example, uh, we want to study not, in fact, uh, with even I think even for nonlinear program, you don't want to study the all any representation of the Galois group. But some there's some uh, some restriction. For example, if you if you think about it in the function field case, if the if a, uh, the Galois group, if you suppose if you have a representation which is trivial on all the inertia. Here, in general, one you want to start for for almost almost all place. But uh, suppose in the function field, if you have a representation which is uh, uh, trivial on the inertia for all places, what you get is in fact a representation of just the fundamental group of algebraic curve, and uh, which is closely related to the. Uh, Topological fundamental group of, of Riemann surface, so that's where the simplest, simplistic, uh, that, for example, that's where the place the uh, the theory for function fields is uh, simpler. But anyway, so we want to start in, in the case of Langlands program. You want to study uh, such representations, which is uh, uh, what's this condition is called uh, unramified for almost. All. Everywhere, plus some condition depending on whether you are uh, in the number field situation or function field situation. So, plus some technical condition. Let me ignore that at the, at the moment. So, these are should uh, correspond to what the so called automorphic forms. So, functions on GO, you should replace. If you think about this one dimensional thing, is here you put the group G1, here you have G1. Now, you want to have G2. Of J two F, which are, uh, in fact, uh, let me see for all for simplicity. Uh, what does it mean for all? Okay. Uh, so you want to study. You want to is Langlands. Program more or less suggests we could. Uh, ah, let me write. That's not the way. Let me write in this here. Okay. Uh, such two-dimensional representation, you should uh, be able to attach a uh, automorphic functions. A automorphic function is just a function with certain conditions on this double coset. Over C, let's see, uh, which is a Hick eigenfunction. Which uh, I'm gonna review the, the meaning of Hick eigenfunction. By the way, when did I start? So when, when should I stop? Five fifteen. All right. All right. Okay. So let's recall. So on this space, there's a uh, action of uh, a large commuted. There's an action of uh, by a large commuted algebra, which is called the Hick algebra. So uh, the definition. Let's just uh, recall. Uh, let me just write it here. So what's the definition? So. The Hick algebra is, in fact, is just if you consider G2, 2 F, Fv, just the group of uh, 
two by two invertible matrix with a coefficient in FV. This is, a, in fact, a locally compact topological group with a, uh, with a nat natural topology, for example, given by a, that contains of a ring open compact subgroup J, J to OV, just the matrix with integral coefficient, then the, there's an the open neighborhood by a, a let's say, principal uh, congruent subgroup. And just just the A, B, C, D, usually A ma D equals D equals one ma pi to the N and the C D equals C to the zero. Ma pi to the N. So here pi is a uniformizer of uh, of a local ring of integer. So this is a topological group, so I can consider, uh, it has a Haar measure, so I can consider the following fun sp uh, space of functions. Let's see, compacted support functions on this topological group, which is by invariant under uh, group J2 times J2. So this, because I have a Haar measure, this, is a, with the, this has an algebra structure given by a uh, involution. I can define the uh, uh, involution. Let's see, over G2 of and define such an involution. And uh, then this algebra would also act on this space of automorphic form by more or less by the same formula. If you think about it, uh, this uh, uh, involution, what you really need is, uh, ah, here I assume, let's see, volume of, uh, I fix a uh, hard measure such as the volume of this open compact subgroup is one. So if you think about it, the involution, what you really need is this uh, function is the right H1 is only need to be right invariant under the action of J2 OV. So therefore, this Hick algebra also acts naturally on the space of automorphic forms. And uh, what is a Hick eigenfunction basically means the following. So you wanna, this F rho, ah, before I go on, let me just uh, remind you, or maybe tell you, uh, if you just think about this Hick algebra as a vector space, just forget the algebra structure. What is it? In fact, it's just the span of all characteristic functions on the double coset. Given one double coset, you get a characteristic function, and the, the whole vector space is span of characteristic. Mm. The whole vector space is span of characteristic functions on double coset, and those are. This is a characteristic functions. Of uh, this double, the following double coset. Where A, B are two integers. And the A bigger than or equal to uh, A bigger than or equal to B. So you can check using this, uh, I don't know, theory of elementary divisor to see. The, you can choose a represent, representative of uh, this double coset by just by those uh, uh, diagonal matrices with A bigger than or equal to B. So that's gonna give you the, uh, as a vector space. So in particular, here is a particular one. I guess usually people denote by T of V. It's just the C, let's see. One zero. Okay. So, so what then? What's uh, going to be the condition of the Hick eigenfunction? You want to this F row. Uh, you want the Hick Hick out Hick operator act on this F row as some particular number. It's eigen. Uh, by the way, this algebra, although a priori is not obvious, but in fact it's commutative algebra. So you can simultaneously diagonalize uh, 
under the action diagonal order operators, and the uh, eigen, eigen, eigenform is uh, eigenvalue for this action. So you want this to be, uh, let me write it uh, precisely. So you want this probably to be AV. Uh, maybe not, let's not call it AV, but um, it's, uh, uh, norm V minus one half of the trace of uh, rho for Venus. Okay, just remember if uh, I have a representation which is uh, uh, trivial on the inertia, then it, uh, in fact, the forbiddenness is a well-defined conjugate class in the Galois group. So it makes sense to talk about the trace. So that's a, that's a uh, part of the Langlands conjecture, which is such Galois representations plus some certain condition should come from, uh, uh, should give, cr correspond to a, um, um, Hick eigenform on G2. Of course, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of progress in this uh, direction, which uh, is not what I'm going to talk about today. So what I really want to talk about is uh, why uh, you make this uh, condition. You want to trace uh, uh, the, the eigenvalue of this operator it's a trace of something, and uh, why we make uh, make this condition? In fact, uh, this uh, 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 to formulate even formulate the some condition like that. What you really want is following. Uh, let me write it. Uh, let me write it here. The following isomorphism, this is so-called Satake isomorphism, or even uh, maybe more precisely, yeah, let me just uh, say, this is uh, a canonical isomorphism of, uh, in fact, this uh, Hick algebra is an uh, algebra generated by two elements. One is this TV, and then the other people, someone called SV, which is a, uh, I guess the uh, characteristic function of the co-cycle, a uh, double coated uh, S uh, C11. So apparently this, because this uh, diagonal matrix omega omega lies in the center, this is invertible uh, element in fact. So turns out the Satake isomorphism says this Heck algebra is isomorphic to uh, basically the conjugate invariant functions on G2, which is a function spanned by a, uh, on G2 there, in fact, this, the ring of uh, conjugate invariant functions are spanned by two elements as well. One is a trace and uh, one is a determinant. Yeah. And uh, uh, the isomorphism called Sakatake isomorphism. And the isomorphism, in fact, sends uh, TV to um, oh, my, to the minus one half power of this element trace, and it sends the SV to the determinant. Yes? S? So this con conjugate invariant functions invariant functions on the group, okay? So this is uh, uh, the Satake isomorphism. So from here you have this formulation. So what I'm uh, really wanna talk is uh, why you should have this isomorphism, why this is true. Uh, Besides this uh, explicit calculation, right? This is, uh, of course, this is an explicit calculation. You can make such isomorphism, but is there any other reason such thing should be true? Uh, before talking about that, let's just uh, make the following ob observation. So if you think about the, the, the algebra of conjugate invariant functions on GO2, 
there's a natural basis given by uh, characters of uh, irreducible representations. Okay, here I just mentioned before, there's a basis given by characteristic functions on double cosets. But it turns out that this isomorphism does not send a, a base, does not send basis here to basis here. Uh, let's just uh, do very simple calculation. You will find that if you consider the multiplying this element the TV square, that's gonna be the characteristic function support of uh, on this uh, two zero element plus, let's see, let's for some place it is assume this is P, okay? It's a P plus one, let's see. So in fact, uh, you will see if, and uh, we know if you take trace times trace, it's gonna be the character of a symmetric square of the standard representation of a GO2 plus the determinant. I mean, like this is like a tensor of V, character of tensor V, V tensor V, so this is a symmetric V plus the exterior power of V, which is the determinant. So you'll see, in fact, uh, uh, the, under the Sataka isomorphism, Sakai, the character of this uh, symmetric power, in fact, is, uh, zero plus of this P, maybe times P to the, maybe times P, I hope this is correct. Okay, so, Uh, so, why such isomorphism exists and how to understand uh, this isomorphism? It does not send a basis to basis. So, it turns out uh, there's some, something much deeper behind that. Uh, to start with, let me just uh, see that uh, this is the following simple observation. So, now let me assume my, to some, now I just move to local field, so I assume my f is just uh, f, f v and o is just o v. So previously f is a global field, now it's a local field. So the first uh, uh, observation is follows. So if you consider g o two f v modulo g o two uh, g o two f modulo g o two o, which is just a half, instead of considering a double coset, you consider just uh, one side quotient. This can be identified naturally with the lattices in F2. Okay, so what is, so by, by a lattice, I mean uh, lattice just means uh, in F2 are just a finite uh, some, uh, just a finite, just let's see, sub O modules, sub O module of lambda of F square, such that lambda when tensor back to F gives you F square. Okay, so basically it's a projective O module of rank two, sits inside F. So the first observation is this set, maybe right is this theorem, but I mean this is not a precise theorem because I did not formulate it in a uh, very precise content. It's uh, this set has some, some algebraic structure. So it's not precise theorem, but let me just uh, mention like that. So if uh, if F is a uh, equal characteristic local field, this is usu usually uh, uh, attributed to a uh, Bovell Laszlo. But of course, I think this is was 
in some sense, this was known much before. For example, in Lustig's work in 1980s, he already considered the uh, adverse structures on this set. And if f is QP, uh, this is some work I considered and uh, also Bart Schotter uh, recently. Uh, so, so I would not give a precise def uh, definition of this algebraic geometric structure here because it it won't be used uh, uh, in at least uh, in the first talk. But uh, let me just give uh, illustrated by two examples. So. Consider the first example. We see that uh, in the Heck algebra, this uh, operator TV plays an important role, which basically is, uh, you can think about the corresponding double coset. Uh, let, me, uh, just, let me write it just like that. Okay. Just look at this is a subset of here. So, uh, let me write k is just a g of 2 o to save some space. So under this identification, ah, by the way, I haven't told you how this, this identification is given. Namely, here there's a, uh, it's just a center coset g k to g times this standard lattice. Of two. That's very easy, okay. Uh, so under this identification, you can check what is uh, this double coset? If you interpret this, uh, interpret this coset by its lattices, it's going to be the lattice lambda in O squared such that the quotient of has length one. Okay? The, as the O module has length one. This is uh, easy. But now you can see such thing is canonically bijective to one dimensional quotient. of, let's see, raised to f, fq squared, which is just uh, my O squared, fp squared, which is my O squared, my um, pi more O squared. Because if, have your, if you have a quotient here, you just take the, its pre-image in O squared, that recovers lambda. And if you have lambda, which has length one, it, it must contain pi times uh, o squared, and then take the quotient, give you the one dimension line. So this is a canonical bijection, and uh, then from here, you immediately see this is in fact uh, bijective to the FP point of uh, projective space. Yeah? So this is a kind of a, a, a easy example. But let's consider something slightly more difficult, uh, more complicated. Uh, according to the Satake isomorphism, you see, in fact, uh, it makes sense to, to consider the uh, double coset, which is support of the sum of these two functions, because that's going to be something correspond to the, uh, the character of a representation. So if I consider the If I consider the, uh, this, this quotient under the previous identification, this corresponds to the lattices inside the O square, such as the length of the quotient, in fact, is two. Okay, let me check. Okay. So the, now the question is, is there any algebraic geometric structure on this set? So now this is, the story becomes a slightly more interesting because now you need to separate two cases. If, if CF is a equal characteristic lo local field, then you can think this. One can think. This set is in fact bijective to any, any such lattice, such as the quotient of length two is contains pi squared O squared. So 
such lattice, in fact, is uh, bijective to the following. Uh, if you can just consider the quotient of O square modulo pi square O square, this is a four-dimensional vector space over FQ, and the such lattice give, gives you a two-dimensional quotient. L. And uh, it's a such a lattice satisfies certain additional property, namely, uh, you want this uh, uh, pi, which induces a new potent endomorphism on set, which is stable as this lattice. Okay, so uh, in this way, you can re really realize this lattice as a, uh, this set as a, some, the subset of some, like, Grassmannian of, of two planes in uh, four dimensional space. Okay, that's my certain condition. In fact, this is a, a, a FP point of sub variety inside this here. Let me write go to, which is uh, inside here. However, now if F is QP, the story is um, more interesting because now you can't regard the uh, of course, the, you still have this quotient lambda, but now this quotient is not going to be a vector space over FP. So, uh, a priori, you, you don't know how this is re related to anything like uh, Grassmannian, like that. Okay, so this is not a vector space. So instead, what you can do is you can consider the following uh, picture. Let me consider a slightly different question. Let me you know, go to tilde, which you classify not just lattice, but a chain of lattices, such that the length uh, L prime, what is it, length L prime, lambda prime, um, is one. Okay, so just uh, as argued before, then if you just remember the first uh, uh, subchain, this is going to be a P1, and uh, then the whole thing, it's easy to say it's going to be a P1 bound over, over P1. In fact, this is uh, going to be the canonical identified with a, a, a FP point of projective uh, P1 bound over P1, and this line bound can be written as a O plus O. Maybe two or something like that. And the, uh, there's a natural map from here to my original thing, such as the lens, the quotient is two. Yeah? This map is uh, almost everywhere bijective, except uh, if my original lattice is pi times O squared then you have a, a P1 family of choice. So in fact, this, what happens is, in fact, this is a, just the P1 bound over P1, but the, what you can see is in this picture, there's a minus two curve on the surface. And uh, you just blow down this, you get a, get a cone, which is grow two. And then this is bijective to grow two of uh, FP. So here the construction is explicit because we know what really happens is you just contract a uh, minus two curve on a surface. Every minus two curve can be contracted in a surface. So, so you get uh, this set is also the set of FP point of some algebraic variety. So what you can do is, uh, for that theory in general, what you can do is you can consider if you have any lattice in general, In general, if you have any lattice inside F2, you can always find a chain of lattices such that uh, you can always get uh, a chain of lattices, maybe sometimes like that, sometimes like, like that, da, 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 such that eventually you reach to the, uh, the lattice we start with, O2, the standard lattice, such that all the length of a, a 
relative to, uh, consists of two lattices are one or minus one. So this is something, let me call it the girl, uh, girl mu. This is which class, you can easily prove that this is an algebraic variety, just uh, as before, just is the, such lattice is a parameter traced by algebraic variety, which is the iterated P1's uh, argument is just as before. And uh, uh, what you can do is you, if you just forget uh, your uh, what happens in the middle, that's, that gives you some lambda and some OT. Okay, so the difficulty of the proof in the, the theorem I mentioned before is in general you don't know, you don't have such explicit description, so you, it's not that easy to contract some sub-varieties. But, uh, but, uh, here, but uh, anyway, the basic idea is here, here you explicitly contract minus two curves. So okay, so uh, that's a algebraic geometric structure on the set. But uh, what I'm not gonna talk, what I'm going to talk about is uh, really the, uh, some, some reason why uh, Sataki isomorphism should hold. Uh, by the way, if you just compare this picture and this, you can think, you can really think this uh, grow tilde two is something like V tensor V, where V is a uh, uh, standard representation. And this, uh, if you project it, uh, push forward of the constant shift on this variety, uh, you can think about it in this way. It, uh, it decomposes as uh, the constant shift on downstairs. Uh, plus a delta shift supported at the origin shifted by two degree minus two. So it corresponds to the H2 of uh, this P1. And this is somehow related to this uh, tensor product is uh, uh, decomposed as symmetric square of V, direct sum of determinant of V. Somehow this is uh, like a, just a, at the moment this is just some analogy. If you just uh, observe there's some analogy. And then, of course, this decomposition also corresponds to the calculation here. But now you, you can make, really make this precise, namely, uh, so let me define a category, zero, this is define a monoidal additive category. Uh, which I first define this is a uh, zero. So in fact, this uh, 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 let me first define it. Objects are just uh, some varieties like that. Parameters of a uh, chain of lattices such that the, the uh, adjacent two has uh, like a length or length one. Just, uh, and what is the just those uh, grow v nu? So v nu, you can think about it's just a sequence of one minus one or something like that. One means, uh, uh, I mean, depending on the in, uh, inclusion relation. So the morphisms come from V nu to V nu, some another variety. You can think about it, this is just, uh, you define the irreducible component of this variety. Uh, of some variety inside here, which is you require. So see what's a uh, grow new, it's a chain of lattices. Uh, this gives you another chain of lattices. You want the, the, the starting They start from the same lattice, this trivial one, but the end of also with the trivial, the same lattice. Okay, so it turns out you can just this. You can easily see this is a closed condition. It defines a closed sub variety inside here. So you just impose a condition like the last two lattices are the same. 
but what non-trivial is uh, all the irreducible components here, appearing here, are exactly half dimensional of uh, this variety. So this is, a, so in fact, a fact, non-trivial fact, this is, these are half dimensional sub varieties. Sub-varieties. Okay, so now after you defining the, uh, to define really define the uh, category, I define the home set. I also need to specify how to compose to morphism. Okay, this is a, sorry, this is span Q span. Let's see. I need to also specify how to compose morphisms. And the composition is given by intersection of algebraic cycles. Intersection product of algebraic cycles. Okay, so this is possible exactly because these are half dimensional sub varieties. So you can define such thing. And then finally the monodal structure is you just uh, compose this sequence. So you make a two, uh, chain of two lattices. You just uh, uh, somehow put them together, Me meaning I just uh, wanna, for example, in the previous example, I mean, uh, let me just give you one example. You have, you have, uh, if you have, uh, in this case, if mu is one, you have the inclusion of length one. And if this is uh, minus one, you have the inclusion in the other direction, okay? So the, the tensor product would be just uh, consider a chain of, uh, first you have a inclusion in this direction and the inclusion in this direction. Okay, so I should say this definition already appears in, uh, for this, it already appears in the work of, uh, uh, this definition of uh, this category already appears in the work of, uh, uh, Fountain Combinator and uh, Cooperberg. All right. So, 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 why make such definition? Here's the theorem. People usually call it, it's not non standard form of geometry sataki, but uh, one can uh, formulate it in this way. If you take just uh, this category and take its idempotent completion, it's going to be, it turns out that it's going to be a Abelian tensor category, and uh, this is equivalent to representation, category of representation of GO2. Where under this equivalence, for example, you, this group one, which classifying a chain of length one, co-length one inside the lambda zero is O square, correspond to the standard representation of GO2. And then this is like correspond to the dues of the standard representation of SO2. So this uh, go minus one goes to do of the standard representation. The tensor product goes to tensor product. And uh, uh, so, um, so maybe, uh, of course, I, I, uh, yes, I, maybe I should, uh, before I stop, maybe I should mention, say a few words about uh, the history and the proof. The proof will be just one word, uh, one line. The, but the, History will be just, uh, huh? Yes, but uh, 
uh, two more minutes. If f is uh, equal characteristic, this is the work of uh, uh, start. This is a long history, but start from the work of Lustig, and some important idea of Dreamfield comes in, and then there's the work of Ginsburg, Merkovich, Veloland. So in historic order. So I guess uh, then. Uh, uh, Yes, if f is qp, it's theorem of mine. And the proof, let me just say one word. The proofs are not uh, independent to each other. So first of all, this, this people prove this for uh, equal characteristic case. Then uh, Using here, you, you, you really use some algebraic curve over FQ, some global curve, some results there to commute, construct the so-called fusion product, which is the most subtle part of the commutativity constraint. Then by some work of Lustig and, uh, uh, and maybe Lustig and Ring, Ring, you get this is some numerical results of uh, F and Heck algebra. And then my contribution is uh, just goes from here to f equals qp case. Okay, so that's the uh, end of the first talk, and uh, the second talk will be some applications of the theorem. <laughs>